time the distance between us No time the distance between us So hungry for your presence, Lord Oh, we're so hungry for the more of you We will cry out day and night Cause you won't satisfy me And you won't fill me up you alone are everything to me Nothing else satisfies every need and every desire I want to pour out my praise to you I want to give another offering of thanks and praise for all you do You won't satisfy every need found in you, yes. Oh, King Jesus, we fully welcome you in the room. King Jesus, oh, we alone make room for you, cause you alone satisfy, and you And you blow life on us again. So spirit of the living God, come and blow on us. Come and blow on us. First life, first life, first healing tonight. And spirit.
days All of our days, all of our days We will give you praise
for your word in Psalm 34 that says those who look to you are radiant and their faces are not ashamed, Lord. So we do gaze upon you. We gaze into your heart and we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. We thank you for your sweet presence that's in this room and that's impacted every heart already, Lord. And we thank you for a wonderful night. We promise to give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, you sound excited already. It's a packed house, so we may need you to squeeze in a little later if uh, there's people that are coming uh, still. And uh, it's always one of Kevin and Kathy's favorite places to come up here. They used to live up in this area, so they love coming up here. So we haven't been up here in a while, so we're glad to be back. Amen. 
And I personally like this location better than the one time anybody was with us downtown. Is that what you call it here? It was crazy down there, wasn't it? So it's a great place to be here, and, and we're thankful for you all. And uh, a few announcements. Um, we have a lot of events still coming up before the end of the year. Um, we are, tomorrow we leave from Maui. Um, yeah, I know. Sometimes you got to do those trips too, right? Uh, but we have a lot of hunger in Maui, and then we go to Honolulu, and then we come back through to Phoenix, and Kevin's doing a couple meetings in Phoenix, and then uh, at, right after that, the week after that, which is about two weeks from now, Kevin will be back in our, uh, up by us in Concord, North Carolina, then back in Florida, Florida, and then Austin, Texas, and then uh, Carlsbad, California. And so I just want to get those out so people know where we're coming. And then uh, we're all, he, uh, Kevin and Kathy are also coming to Texarkana and um, uh, Florida again. So we got wonderful, wonderful places still before the end of the year uh, because Kevin likes to stay busy preaching the gospel. Amen. So, so if you're watching online, please sign up for one of those events. There's still time to fly over to Hawaii. It's like straight across almost from here. So or whatever direction it is. But uh also, one of the things uh, working for Kevin that I'm privileged to do is oversee the Warrior Fellowships. And uh, I don't know if there's anybody in here that's involved in the Warrior Fellowship, but we have them in this area. And we want you to get involved. A Warrior Fellowship is a, is a Bible study where, where we have a host who's a student in our school, which uh, Pastor Michael will talk about in a minute. And uh, that we have a Bible study where Kevin comes up on the screen, him and Kathy, and they share about 20, 25 minutes of teaching. It's powerful. It's impactful. Then there's a PDF to follow. And then the group kind of goes through the PDF, the video. They have fellowship. They eat. They pray. They worship. They minister to the poor. Uh, they invite the community. So these fellowships are, are amazing. I mean, they're all over the world. We just got back from Germany in literally, check this out, Germany, uh, the fellowships surround the entire country. Uh, they're all like on the outskirts. And, and there's one in Berlin, Germany, where we just were. And so uh, we want to impact this area in a greater way because Kevin can only come here so much. And so we want to make a, uh, Kevin wants to make a greater impact. There is one host I know for sure, Mary Brown. Where are you, Mary Brown? Okay, there's Mary Brown. She is hosting a one. She is hosting a fellowship in this area in the... Um, Mount Lake Terrace area. Is that right? Okay, I'm, I'm sure you know what that means. But uh, she is hosting a warrior fellowship there. And so you can see her. She's got little pamphlets. Please see her. And if you are, are also a host here, just let me know. But we want to get, uh, we want to have more fellowships going on. Because lastly, what is happening is the testimonies that are coming in. Of course, people are getting saved. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm getting the emails. People are getting saved in the fellowships. There's teenagers coming, college students coming. Uh, there, there's deliverance. There's marriages coming back together. All that are, are in the emails. But also a big part of it is Kevin's heart to see the, the poor, the needy, the orphans, the widows, the, the elderly being ministered to. We actually have one fellowship that meets under a bridge with homeless people. Yeah, it's amazing what God's doing. So you need to plug in. If you want to host, to say, listen, I want to be a part of that Bible study. All you have to do is sign up to be a student, and there's free courses, and you can get more involved like that. Amen? Amen. Well, we want to receive an offering together. If our ushers would come, we, uh, we are, are thankful that you're here, and you know Kevin's hard on tithing. How many understand, uh, have listened to Kevin about giving and receiving and tithing and offering? This is a no pressure, no arm twisting offering. You do not have to give, but we feel it is a biblical principle to give you the opportunity to, to uh, give in an offering. And so uh, we do do that. And so if you want to give in this offering, you can do that. You can make your checks out to Worry Notes. If people still write checks, I don't know. But uh, if you want to do uh, text to give, you, the number should be on the screen for all those who are watching. Uh, but we thank you ahead of time for sowing, for giving, for being a part of this ministry. Amen. Father, we thank you for all that you're doing in Seattle and the surrounding area. Lord, we thank you that you, your kingdom is making a mighty impact, Lord. 
And I thank you, Lord, that from this moment on, this whole area will be changed for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Mike. Amen. So the word on the street is that Seattle is hungry for the fire of God. I don't know if you heard that or not. Just rumor. You know, I don't know if it's true or not. But I'm pretty sure you guys are going to make it true one way or another, right? We're so excited to be with you guys. We love Seattle. We love what God is doing. And I don't know if you know this, but we have crossed the line. We're over 30,000 students at Warrior Notes School of Ministry. Isn't that awesome? And I believe we got a couple grads here, and we got a couple that are almost there. And let me tell you what's amazing and what's happening at Warrior Notes is that the church is rising up. And that it's not about making another building, but it's about getting outside the building, and it's loving on people and helping the poor and making disciples. Can you believe it? Making disciples. It's almost like a lost art, but we're going to bring it back, aren't we? We're going to bring it back. So thank you guys for being here. I believe tonight's going to be a very special impartation. We know it's going to be. And so you're here tonight and you're going to receive that. And uh, I want to also highlight a couple things that, um, and, and I know this is really close to you guys, but we've got a very special conference coming up in El Paso, Texas. You guys are close to El Paso, right? I, last time I looked at the map, you just moved there a little bit. But for everybody that's online, we, we're really targeting El Paso too, just like Seattle and some of these other key cities, because we believe that God is bringing a fresh fire and ready to touch his people. And so believe between Seattle and Phoenix and El Paso and Florida, God is moving in a mighty way. And you guys are a part of it. It was in your books before you were even born. I don't know if you looked last time, but in a book in heaven, it's got your name in it. And it says you've got destiny on you. I don't know if you know that. But tonight is going to be very special. And so for all the partners and for all the students that are here, I want to say a big, big thank you on behalf of Kevin and Kathy and all the Warrior Notes team, because you guys are making this possible. You know, to be in the countries that we were just in and then to be here and all over the place, we couldn't do it unless you guys were with us in the spirit, praying for us. And so I want to thank you guys so much. You guys are making this so all happen, and you're so near and dear to Kevin and Kathy's, everybody's heart. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, because it's you guys are the ones that are called to do the fellowships, and you guys are the ones that are called to feed the poor and help people, right? Because we can't do this without you. And so I want to encourage you, if you're a student, man, keep going after God. Keep getting into your courses because the more you can get equipped, the more you can get the fire of God, the more you can get deliverance and healing, you will see angels, you'll see the power of God, you'll see signs, wonders, and miracles, right? Because that's what we're after. We're not looking for a dead church. We're looking for a very alive church, right? And so thank you guys for being a part of all this. And 30,000 students, and here we are ready to see God move in Seattle, right? All right, let's give it up, Dr. Kevin Zedai. So anyway, we want to do this. This so, so we haven't forgot about Seattle. God has not forgot about Seattle. Um, tonight, getting into 
to more of the, um, what the Lord's message is for tonight. It was very interesting that he said, I want you to talk uh, about the, the message that I gave you a couple weeks ago. He actually gave it to me in, in Germany. And um, we, we had a, a huge showing there in, in Berlin. It was, it was amazing. I, I mean, I, I, didn't, I couldn't believe that that church could fill up like it did. It did fill up. And people, they were so hungry for God. And um, one of the things that, that came out during that meeting was that the, the Lord had not forgotten them and that it was time for payback. Uh, in, in Germany was going to have a restoration. And, and here's what I want, uh, the message that he gave me that I'm going to speak on tonight. I've been holding it. And um, I, I want to talk to you about understanding your choking point. And um, this is something that the Lord had spoken to me about a long time ago. And, and it's a very complicated subject when you know the mindset of the people. Uh, and I know your mindset because I am one of them. And I don't forget that I am a sheep, too, you know. And um, we all are very complicated. Just ask your friends. They'll tell you. They're very complicated uh, we don't understand ourselves sometimes, but, you know, the enemy just gets very excited when you say that. that he gets very excited when you don't understand yourself, and he, uh, he's very excited when you don't understand God. He gets very excited, just like he gets excited when you celebrate Halloween. But that's another subject, too. But anyway, just poke in the bear, maybe see if it's still hibernating or not. We're going to poke, poke the bear, and um, anyway... Um, the, say, you, Satan, one of the things that I've learned is, is that people that understand warfare, they, they, study, they study their enemy. So they, they know how the enemy thinks. So they, they kind of already have strategy-wise, you know, you could say something. I could push you in a certain direction. I know exactly what's going to happen when I say it. And I can push you in a certain direction to get a response out of you. And that's exactly what your government does. They want to see how you respond. So it's really all about behavior. It's all about response. So the enemy does this. And this is what is profound. In, 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 um, you're going to see this when you go to heaven. But why wait? Because the enemy cannot, cannot hear your thoughts. And if you don't say anything, he knows nothing. So what he does is he tries to get you to respond to something. So he tries everything. So he either pulls you in a direction or he pushes you. He either tries to seduce you. If you say, no, I'm on keto, I'm not eating that ice cream, then then he will start something else. He'll say, man, you know, their friends will come and say, it looks like you gained weight. <laughs> so he's going to try to pull you into seduction. If he can't, if, he, if you resist that, then what he will do is he will attack you, attack you, and he will, he will try to make you a victim. He will come at you to make you feel bad. So he's going to either get you flattery to seduce you or he's going to reject you. Either, neither one of them are good. I, I, just, I just want to go to heaven and do everything I'm supposed to do. I don't care if I'm recognized or not. I really don't care, but I do want to be heard. But see, you have to speak from the Spirit. And anything you say, you are telling where you're going and you're telling where you're, you are. So when you talk, you can be located. So Satan pushes you to do or say something in order to see what's going on in your head because he doesn't know. So he has to condition you to respond. So he gets excited when he can figure out a pattern that's predictable with you. So he figures out what your red buttons are, and he pushes them once a month. And he may, he may pick a full moon, you know. He does. Because he doesn't have a watch. So he has to watch the stars, he has to watch the moon and the sun, and he has to 
create a response from you. And he has to condition you to respond a certain way so that you become predictable. Because he doesn't know what you're thinking. So he pushes you or he pulls you to say something or to do something so you can be located. So that is why it is so important that when you speak, you realize that your tongue is a rudder and that where you're going is what you're saying. So if you're saying nothing, you're, you're dead in the water. But when you do speak, you have to be sure that you want to wear that because you're ordering something and you better order your size. So if you're going to criticize someone, order your size because it's coming back and you're going to have to wear it. So if you're critical and you judge someone, Jesus said, not me, don't get mad at me. He said, he said you will be judged by the same. So just order your size. Okay, so when you talk, you should be speaking from where you are in Christ where he's, you're seated with him in the, at the right hand of God, and then you also need to be speaking your destination. You need to be saying where you're going. And it's very, very common to hear out of my mouth, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it. I just know you're going to do it. Amen. I know you're doing something, but I don't have to say what it is. I could be healed and not even understand healing. You could be using the gifts of spirit and not take in my class. You don't have to take a class. Did you know that God could still bless you financially and you don't give? Oh, boy. Did you know that, that his favor and his grace and his mercy on you is why you're still alive? And all of, his, of your money is his. You just haven't found that out yet. So you can't give to get. He's not an ATM. I saw him on the throne. He's not an ATM, and he's not a slot machine. He is a person who loves you, and he wants you to worship him in spirit and truth, which means you should never do anything unless it's from your heart. You should do something from your heart because Jesus said when you, when you are praying and you say to a mountain, say it, he said you believe in your heart. not in your head. So faith is of the heart. So when you speak, you're speaking from your spirit. You're saying it with your mouth and you're believing in your heart that what you say with your mouth will come to pass and it shall come to pass. He said, that's why you should believe that you received it when you pray, not, not when it comes. You, you believe, I believe before I pray. I just went the whole way with and got the platinum package which automatically defaults to me getting it. The reason I get it is because he already wrote it down before I was born. I wasn't in the meeting. Everything that we are to do in Christ was before the foundations of the world. If you want to bring Paul into it, he predestined us. That's not Calvinism. That doesn't mean that some are saved and some are not, that some are predestined to do all these great things and others aren't. Every one of us was chosen by the blood of the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. So your choking point does not exist unless it's in your mind. Because Paul clearly said that it is between our family in heaven and us on the earth. It's be, he said together with both of us, we fulfill God's plan for the ages. So it's one family in heaven and on earth. So there are people in heaven that I met that don't have a choking point. And so I always say I'm with them. In other words, they already paved a way that's further than I can ever pave. I can't do this. I can't do what I'm doing now. But someone else already did it, and someone else already prayed for me. So everything I need for life and godliness has already been given to me through Christ. In fact, everything that I already have is inside of me. Everything. I mean, in the eternal life and on this earth, I already have it. It is everything that I need for life and godliness. 
And anything I can ask or think, it's exceedingly above that, it says. Paul said it's exceedingly above what we can ask or think. So it hasn't even entered into my mind what God has for those who love him. But it says that we know this by the Spirit, because the Spirit searches the deep things. But the Spirit has to search the deep things, and then he has to reveal it to us. And this is where choking points have to be destroyed. Because if you're saying that you're going to fulfill God's plan in this life, it is not going to be you crawling on your knees to get there. I'm going to show you this. You literally, you literally have been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms, which means in the spirit, you can blow right through Satan's living room. He's the prince of the power of the air. So you just blow right through his living room. Look at you all. No one talks like this. That's why I'm here. Okay. What's he trying to say? I'm not trying to say anything. I'm telling you how it is. I mean, even the mafia says, if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. All right, here we go. This is, pres- this, is, this is what you should know now, and this is how you can nail Satan, and he will stop. He will stop his, his uh, activity in your life because what he's trying to do is provoke you to do something or say something. If you don't do that, he just goes on to somebody weaker. See, if all of you would, would, just, would not eat macaroni and cheese, it would just go away. Because there's no macaroni and no cheese. It's just, who knows, it's a mystery. It's just like spam. It's a mystery. And they're still eating it in Hawaii from World yeah, War II. Right? It's still, yeah, it's like World War II. You go to McDonald's, you get the, the big breakfast. It comes with two slices of spam. Spam and eggs and rice. And then there's purple stuff. And that's your big breakfast. Okay, so this is what, this is what Paul said. He said in um, Colossians chapter 1, everybody's listening, right? Okay, Colossians 15, verse 15 in chapter 1. So 1 15 says, he is the image of the invisible God. So God is invisible, but Jesus was the image of that. So Jesus just was the picture that he went around showing of his father. He literally was the image of a God who it says is invisible. Okay, but he's not invisible to our spiritual eyes. And so that's why we need to learn how to live more in the spirit because this world will promote the the psychological realm and the physical realm. Why? Because they can get those two to vote your spirit off the island. In other words, your, your spirit will not get a much attention. It'll get a cold snack once a week instead of a hot meal in church. You'll get a cold snack just to make it in between diseases. Well, you, are you waiting for the, the disease of the week? Are you waiting for the next Greek alphabet letter to come up? Is, is it going to be llama this week? And it was bat, then monkey. Now, I mean, are you waiting for the next thing to happen? You can't do this. You see, because Satan is trying to get humans to be predictable by getting a response to see how they deal with hardship. He, he's, he's a taskmaster. master, And um, he, Paul nails him right here. He says, he says that, for by the Lord Jesus Christ, all things were created in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether they're invisible or visible, thrones and dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him and by him. And he is before all things. So Jesus didn't appear in a manger. He was pre-existent. And he ruled before he came here. He created all things. It says it right here. Okay, so he's the one that you need to get your direction from because he has the last word. But what if you had that last word inside of you and then you spoke that? What if you would say, like I say every day, the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our God? 
it doesn't matter who's in office or who's not. It doesn't matter. All these things are still subject to Jesus Christ through the church. So it's us that have to make the difference. If not, then things will happen that are not supposed to happen, which is what we've been dealing with, but not anymore because we're all going to grow up. And, um, you know, we will have boxes for you to turn in your diapers and your, and your bottles. And we're going to have steak. We're going to have meat. We're going we're gonna to eat the meat of the word is what Paul said. He said, I wish that I could address you as spiritual. He was talking to the Corinthians, you know, one of the wild bunch that, that was, it was a wild meetings they had. They had to line people up for the gifts of the Spirit. All nine gifts, they had to line up, okay, two or three, but do it decently in order. Don't talk while the speaker's talking. He said, okay, three prophecies, three tongues and interpretations, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, okay, and uh, gifts of healing over here, and they all line up. Every one of you is like in line. There's nobody in the congregation. This is the way the Corinthian church was. Everybody has a song. Everybody has a hymn. Everybody has a word. Paul said that. Okay, decently and in order. And this is the church. So all of you should be yielding to the Spirit, but Paul said, he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He talked about how the Spirit searches the deep things, and a spiritual person does, does, does not, is not subject to any person's judgment. They make judgments about all things, but they're not subject to a carnal person's judgment. The people of the world he's talking about, they can't judge you because they don't understand the Spirit. It goes in, it clearly says, as he goes on through that chapter to the end, he talks about the fact that People that don't know the Holy Spirit can't make judgments about spiritual things. It's clear that you all cannot be judged by the world. So it says it at the end of chapter 2 that we, through the Spirit, can know all things. We have the mind of Christ. It's no longer a mystery. And Paul talks about this in all of his books. He says, the mystery that was hidden in ages past has now been revealed. So there is no new DVD series coming out. This, this, it's already been revealed 2,000 years ago, and we haven't moved from that. We have not moved on. So Paul says in chapter 3, the very next chapter, he said, I wish I could address you as spiritual, but you're mere babies, carnal. He said, when you should be on meat in your diet, you're on milk. Okay, he's telling people that you would think would be spiritual because you think that the gifts of the Spirit is what makes you spiritual. It is not. The gifts of the Spirit are not you. Those are gifts that were given to you. That's the Holy Spirit. So being spiritual is when you can take what is in that realm, the spiritual realm, and yank it into this realm and implement it. And it has to do with character. Which means that when you want to opt out with your mouth, you shut up. You don't opt out. You don't choose to say what you're feeling. Paul did this all the time. He was in jail. You wouldn't even know it by the books he wrote. He was in jail when he wrote these books. And he didn't speak from his circumstances. He spoke from his revelation. So what's Seattle doing? Are you speaking from your circumstance or from your revelation of what the Holy Spirit is saying through the Word of God? This is how you move on. This is how you mature. Okay, so Paul clearly says this, and it's getting into the good part. It's still today. We have plenty of time. It's still today. Okay. All right, so he is before all things, and in him things hold together. Okay, so not only did he create them, Jesus, he holds them together by his word. Okay, that's how powerful his word is. So if he prayed for you in John 17, I don't know what you're worried about. He said three things. He prayed three powerful things that he pointed out to me that eliminate choking points. So when I come back, I will share this next year. No, I would. John 17, he said this I pray, Father, that they would know the unity that we share, the Trinity shares, that we, we were together and we have unity. He said that they would understand and know this unity that me and you shared. Okay, so we can know the unity of the Trinity. 
No, the unity of the Trinity is this. None of them would ever be weak because it's like a three cord. It's three ropes together, which is not easily broken, according to Solomon. Okay, but the Trinity isn't the problem. It's the church that Jesus bought back that is weak. We're weak because we are not God. So he has to strengthen us. So when you feel like you're going to give up, that's why Paul said, I get excited and actually glory in my weaknesses because then I am going to have his power revealed through my weakness, in my weakness, not in my strength. So think about it. All of the teachings that I grew up with on, in the Bible were trying to pump me up. I'm going to pump you up. Hans and Franz. Remember them? Yeah. Sorry, not Hans and Franz. So we're going to pump you up. And they pump you up, and they're getting you plump for failure. Because you, you have to be able to have the character to walk in this. It's not just having muscles. Because you could take steroids and get muscles real fast. But to make it permanently you is what I'm after. And that's what Paul's after, permanency. Permanency, uh, fruit that lasts. The, the kind of thing where you arrive before you get there and people feel it. You, they, you touch people before you even arrive. Before you, you can walk into a city and the city starts to sense, the people start to sense this, ha this, this happens to many, many people. Many people who walk in authority, the devils know it. Okay, so your choking point is eliminated when you have the revelation that we share in the same unity of the Trinity. Now, Jesus prayed that we would have this. How many believe that if Jesus would pray for you, you would receive? Okay, so you know you got it. Okay, so you understand unity, but see, to me, Unity is strength. Being alone is not strong. We need each other. Okay, he also instructed us. He said, Father, reveal the love you have for them because, listen, you love them just as much as you love me. So Jesus said that the Father loves you just as much as he loves himself. Jesus is, Jesus is his son, so you know how much the Father loves Jesus. Jesus said, you love the people that I'm praying for just like you love me. Can you imagine the Father loving you as much as Jesus? But that's absolutely truth. So if you want to become unpredictable to the devil, then you grasp these two things. But don't stop there. There's a special tonight, an added bonus, if you act now. Paul, Paul said... No, Paul, Jesus prayed, also, also, Father, share with them the same glory that me and you shared. Are you ready? In Aramaic, it says that me and you shared before we lit up the universes together. Now, now all of you, all of you have to understand that if you were in heaven and you got sent back, you would know these things. You would know the power of Paul's words and Jesus' words. You would know that all the Bible is true and you would know that it's very powerful. However, it's not powerful unless you pick it up and you use it. Having six Bibles in your house does not scare the devil. <laughs> Having one in your lips makes you lethal. Just one. And actually, just one, one verse would be fine because you're lethal if you have been able to pick that up and use it accurately. It doesn't take much. But you have to establish yourself in your domain. Wherever God assigns you, you have to be established. And you do that by speaking. This isn't, this isn't like word of faith or... All this, this is Jesus. Jesus actually wrote Mark 11, 23 and 24. Kenneth Hagin did not write Mark 11, 23 and 24. <laughs> this, is, this is so powerful. And you're going to find, trust me, I hope it happens before Jesus comes back that you get this. You're going to find that your finances are being held up 
in this world system and that you need to speak and command Satan to let go of them. And you can keep giving and giving and giving, but it's just going to start to dam up. I didn't swear. That, that is actually a barrier. <laughs> it's going to hold back because Satan is controlling the supply. So when you speak to the mountain and you tell it to leave, it wasn't, and I'm going to offend a lot of people, and I'm really happy about it, but you cannot give to break the dam. You give because you love God, but to get it to you, you have to speak with your mouth because Satan is the God of this world. Oh, where's that? I'm glad you asked because we're just going to keep reading because this is all rigged. I've been, I've been walking you right into this. Okay, this is what Paul said. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might have the preeminence. For in him all the fullness of God was, was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself whether on the earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you, now listen, everybody's listening, right? Okay. And you who once were alienated and hostile in your mind, doing evil deeds. He has now reconciled in his body of the flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if you indeed continue in your faith. So you have to continue in your faith. Stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation in heaven and of which I, Paul, am a minister. Okay, so he literally, even in Ephesians, he talks about the prince of the power of the air. He talks about the fact that we all used to obey that, that prince. And it says that we had no resistance to him. Okay, so now we've been translated. It's been transferred. Trans, we've been taken across into the kingdom of light. So now we've been translated into the kingdom of light. Now we can stand against and break the powers. So serpents and scorpions are supposed to be stepped on. They're not supposed to be holding office. <laughs> So you have to take authority. You do, if somebody can't fix it in 47 years, they should step aside. Okay, but what's happening is evil spirits are playing tag. So they groom people. So if you think that certain person was the Antichrist because his name you know, added up to 666, where you were probably right. But they went unseated because of the church being here. Yeah. Does everybody understand yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Paul already said this in Thessalonians. You ought to read it. These people had quit their jobs because Jesus was coming back in a few weeks. Paul said, if you don't work, you don't eat. He said, these are the things that will happen when Jesus comes back. Until all these things happen, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, will not be revealed. So he goes through all the, the process. He said that he cannot appear because you know who it is that's holding him back. That's why you have mirrors. You have mirrors in your house so that you can look at yourself and say, I am the church. You are the body of Christ on the earth. That's what mirrors are for. To remind you that you're it. There's no one else coming. You're it. You're the one that was chosen for this generation. So you don't listen to the spirit of the air. Anymore, You don't obey his impulses. Everything is set up for you. The steps of a righteous person are ordered or numbered by the Lord. So if you acknowledge him in all your ways, he will direct your paths. I mean, to quote the Bible, if you want to bring the Bible into it. I mean, what have we done? We've made it so complicated. Why? Because we have been corralled. We have, we have been 
brainwashed to respond. And now we brace in fear for the next bad thing to happen. But you got to remember that they were bracing for the Antichrist to be seated in 65 AD. Just so you know, that was a pretty long time ago. Okay, so because they were sitting, he also wrote to the Colossians. Paul wrote to the Colossians, which at the top of the manuscript says Laodicea. Okay, well, that rings a bell, doesn't it? Because that's one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and partially 3. Okay, now listen to this. To the church at Laodicea, right. Okay, this is 95 A.D. Okay, so Jesus was on the earth in the 30s. Paul was on the earth in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Okay, Paul wrote to the Colossians which is the Laodiceans as well. Okay, so he's, he wrote what I just read to the Laodiceans. 30 years later, Jesus appears to John on the Alpatmos and says, you guys are in trouble. Now think about this. They thought they were rich and they were poor. They thought they, they could see, but they were blind. They thought they were well clothed, but they were naked. Somebody had to tell them they were naked. Somebody had to tell them the truth. Why? Because they were totally deceived. So Jesus came, Paul came, and then Jesus came again through John, and Laodicea disappeared. In northern Turkey, all those seven churches are gone. And this all happened that the, just 2,000 years ago. Okay, so here we are reading Colossians tonight, and you're all sitting there, and I mean, how many of you really can honestly say, that you understand and you live by what I read. What happens is, is we learn nothing from history. We learn nothing. And you can pick it up because you read and you see the history books and you better read it before they erase it. <laughs> but you read and you see that we don't learn anything. And, and what happens is they try to take away what people paid for your freedom, they try to take that away so that you don't know the price that was paid for what we have. It takes away the foundation so that there's nothing to build upon. And so the children coming up don't have the same foundation unless you educate them. Okay? All right. So, Paul, the choking point, getting to the choking point. To share in the same glory that the father and the son shared it. Can you imagine... You, can you imagine that Paul said this glory is within us? And he said that it's through the church that this glory will be revealed in the last days and that it would testify to the powers of the air. It says it right there, that it would testify. But the word there is to judge. It brings judgment on the powers of the air. And so this is the shaking that must happen. But when this happens, when the shaking happens, I have been putting out a warning because things are going to start to appear in the heavens. Things that are there are going to start to be visible. Things are going to fall out of the sky. Things are going to start to appear, and it's going to be used to deceive many. And Jesus said that even the very elect could be deceived, if that were possible. Jesus said a lot of things. He said, listen, this is a hard saying and many will not accept it. But he said, if you can accept it, you should. He said, Moses was given a certificate of divorce to give to people. He said, but it was not the, the will of the Father from the beginning. It was because of your hardened hearts that I did this. It was never from the beginning. Jesus says things, but he said, this is really hard. He said, actually, the way to eternal life is narrow and few. Few find it. Few find it. But wide is the road to destruction, and many find that and, and, and enter into that. So the church is the final plan for God. So there is no mystery. It's been revealed. There is no new plan. There's no new prophetic utterance. It has been revealed, and we have been chosen. And in 2,000 years of this been given since Paul, We've, we've done very little with it. We're, we're, you know, working on World War III. We've gone through world wars. We've gone through all these things. 
All these embarrassing things in history. I wish they'd take those away. But we're going to argue about the shape of the earth. (laughs) And it's too late because you go around it. It's too late. I've already done it, okay? It's, it's too late. It's not a pizza. Okay, but this is the thing that Satan will do. This is what he'll do. He'll bring up something that nobody's asking about. Listen, I'm all with you. I watched a fly. I watched a fly during the filming of them on the moon. There's a fly. Flies aren't on the moon. Okay, so I get what you're saying. Okay, I get all that. But let's not focus on those things. Let's focus where Christ, Paul said, your focus should be where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. There's no flies up there either. Because, because it actually says, Jesus calls him the father of flies. Father of Beelzebub, which is the father of flies. So he said, when you speak your language, you're speaking your father's language. And he was a liar from the beginning. You Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you sons of the devil. It was the head denomination of the day. He said, you make sons of hell when you make a convert. You make them twice the son of hell that you are. Okay, so he came against those people and he came against religion He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Who cares what the shape of the earth is? Okay, so I can do this with everything. Everything is solvable. Everything is understandable, but you're going to have to search for it. However, do you want to spend time doing that in a generation that could be the generation that actually does something that builds upon Paul? Paul's revelation was the foundation. That's it. That's all that's... There is no more foundation. The apostles and the prophets that laid that foundation, they, they cannot be matched. You cannot write scripture. So if you want to be an apostle... They don't have any spots for authors. There's no openings for authors or even editors. So if you want to be an apostle or a prophet, you might just want to be a non-prophet. <laughs> because, because you're not going to have the same level. Because Paul said that this was already built on the apostles and the prophets. So you're not on that list. And this is, what Mar- Mar- uh, this is what Martin Luther did when, when the Catholic Church had this intermediary between God and man, which was the Pope and the priests and everything. And this happens with, with prophets and apostles these days. And they, they, be, they put themselves in as a middleman and they broker for God. But it's a small G sometimes, you know. They're brokering for a small G God. Martin Luther said, there's only one mediator between God and man, and you're not on the list. And he told the Catholic Church that. He said, you're not on the list. There's only one mediator, and it's not you. Well, that went over well. But then if you remember all the reformers, everybody that came up, including Jesus, Jesus got kicked out of the synagogue. But you got to remember, Jesus spoke in the synagogue every week, he was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He could, he could get up and speak. He, could, he had people following him. He was a rabbi. So he had, he had his teachings. He, he taught disciplines. That's what a rabbi did. A teacher taught disciplines. And he had people that followed him. They were called disciples because they listened to his disciplines 
and they were called disciples. So Jesus said, go out and make disciples. He didn't say go make converts. He said, make permanent teachers, permanent people, disciples. He said, mentor people. Don't just process them as converts. Okay? So we need to not build a foundation anymore. And so there's this competition to try to figure out what we're going to write next, what we're going to preach next, what DVD series. And we're trying to think of all these different subjects that might sell a book instead of just helping people, which would be bringing forth what is already revealed. Okay, so now that I have done my introduction, we can get into the meat of this. <laughs> this, this is what I wanted to talk about. Your choking point is only there to make you predictable. So when you say, well, I'm never going to be this, you're just calling it in. Because there's no one in heaven, though, that agrees with you. The Holy Spirit, if it's written about you to do something, you say you're not going to do that or you're never going to do that or I can't do that, that is partially true. At least, at least you're 50-50 there because you can't do it. But see, everybody that ever did anything for God in a generation was somebody who couldn't do it. Because I never look for something I can do. That's not supernatural. Supernatural is when God tells you to do something you can't do. Because it's about to be a holy moment. It's about to be a supernatural journey that's beginning. When you're called, it should be supernatural. And it be, the calling should be, I can't talk, Lord. Can you send my brother-in-law or whoever, you know, Aaron? Can he be my speaker? Well, Moses was trained under Pharaoh, to be the next Pharaoh, it was the university today, he knew how to speak. He knew how to, he knew how to lead. He was trained as an orator. He had the best. But when he went out into the Midian Desert for 40 years, the Midian Desert, did I mention the Midian Desert? Which means that Sinai is in Arabia, Saudi Arabia. Which makes sense because Paul said, you know, that he went there to the mountain of God in Saudi Arabia. He says it right there. Okay, so Moses spent time in the desert where he would eventually take all the people. He knew that desert like the back of his hand. But he didn't speak that much for 40 years. You have to remember that 80 years of preparation to do one job, and he ended up striking the rock instead of speaking to it the second time. So Moses said he can't talk. And yet he led all those millions of people out. And it says that he was the most humble person or man on the earth. And he wrote that. So he, he actually lost his award, you know. But that's just like the guy, the guy in church who, who was, he was the most humble person in church, and so they gave him an award, and he wore it the next week, and he lost it. They took it back, you know. But it actually means the word there is afflicted. He's the most afflicted man on the earth is what it actually says. And you can get this from the fact that people were thorns in the sides of the Israelis, and that the enemy can be a thorn in your flesh. And it would talk about the th people being the thorn, and then an evil spirit could be a thorn in your flesh. And so an evil spirit can be a thorn in your flesh and poke you. And you could beg the Lord to take it away, and he won't, because you're supposed to. God could not take it away from Paul because Jesus was seated at the right hand of God, which means he's not going to stand up and do anything more about the devil. 
That went over well. <laughs> the thorn was given by Satan, not by God. I mean, if you, if you want to read, you know, a messenger of Satan, not a messenger of God. So Paul had to overcome, just like you're going to have to overcome. Jesus is not going to do another thing about the devil because you're going to do something about the devil because he's already done everything he's going to do. He's seated. He's not standing. He's seated. Okay, so all of you, all of you, I'm telling you this because don't wait. Let's be the generation that actually sparks and ignites and creates a flow on this earth that finishes up God's plan. We're here because we have not done what is written in heaven. We're known in heaven, and you know who is in heaven, but the ignition has not happened to where it burns outside of you. It's not enough to just come to the meeting and feel the fire. You are the fire. There's no other fire. The altar is full of fire in heaven, but that does not help us down here and unless an angel takes a coal and touches our lips. So we were cleansed by Jesus Christ. Isaiah was cleansed by a coal from the altar because Jesus was, was seated at the throne at the time in Isaiah 6. He was not on the earth yet. Now he's been here, done that, yeah, and he's back seated again. Now he's waiting for his enemies, it says, to become his footstool. And it's through the church. And that's us. Okay, so the thing that we need to focus on tonight is we need to focus on the love of God. We need to focus on the unity. And we need to focus on the glory. Those are the three things that Jesus prayed for us. Unity, love, and glory. He did not mention faith. Because the greatest of these things is not faith. It, faith. There's faith, hope, and love that remain, but the greatest is not faith. The greatest of these is love. And the fact of it is, is love is what sent me back. Because Jesus said, I need you to go back and tell the people what you saw and what you heard. He said, you're not going back for yourself. You're not staying here for yourself. You're going back for the people that I'm sending you to. I had no reason to come back here. I was sent back for people. Okay, that's God's love, because that is not my love. <laughs> but it was interesting, there were no angels, there were no little angels. They, weren't, they didn't have grapes in their hands, there was no clouds. So there was not gonna be clouds with angels feeding you grapes. <laughs> cherubs, cherubs have I don't know how big their wings are, but they're, 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 they're more than 30 feet long. So it's, a cherub is not like some little baby angel. There are no baby angels. Because you, you're created as an angel without gender. There's no gender. They don't have the parts. So they are created. They're not born. They do not have gender. They cannot procreate. And they only do the bidding of the Lord. The ones that were deceived and fell were because Satan fell. And they were under him. And there weren't that many of them. I mean, in comparison to how many there are. And God can make as many angels as he wants. He already has replaced them. Because he can do what he wants. I don't know if you know that. But he can do what he wants. And he can make angels. And he can make a whole army just for you because you haven't got it yet and you need help. So he can create a whole army just for you and send them to you just to get you to do what you need to do. He can do any of that. However, what he likes is when you choose to engage him, not on your level, on his level. Okay, on his level, there is no choking point. In fact, it's not in the conversation. Now, I'm telling you this because you're going to hear this. When you're in eternity, you're going you're to stand before the Lord. You're going to hear all this. 
And I, I, just want, I just want to help you out. I'm giving you all the answers to the test so that you can do it right and do it now. I would do it before you go home. I would get it right with the Lord. I would turn myself in and say, you know what? I don't want to be a boat anchor anymore. I want to be part of the solution. I don't want you dragging me around anymore. I want to be ahead of you with the horses. I want to be part of the pace makers. And that's not something that's making your heart work. This is a pace that is set by God's army, set by heaven, angels. They set the pace. Okay, so all of you need to allow your mind to be restored. How you restore it, it has to be changed. It has to be transformed. You have to have a transformation. This is something that is a miracle because it's part of your psychological makeup because your spirit is born again, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You're a new creature, new creation. The old has passed away, so it doesn't exist anymore. And there is no files in heaven to convict you. However, going forward, you have to have your mind transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is in Romans 12, too. After you do that, you only have your body left. And your body, Paul said, I discipline my body so that after I preach Christ myself, I have, do not allow my body to cause me to be disqualified. So your body can rule you and cause you to be disqualified after preaching Christ, after you do everything right, your body could make you disqualified. So he told the Corinthians this. Okay, but Paul, Paul was a different individual than what you think because you can look through every, you could do a word search. It's on the internet, it must be true, right? No, but did you know that he never preached hell? But he believed in it. But he said that the goodness of God leads people to repentance. He didn't say the fear of hell. Come on. Yes. And he said, faith worketh through love. Love is the greatest. But you know what? It's so interesting. If I would write a book right now on love, it probably wouldn't even sell. But I have 62 books that have five-star ratings. 62 books in five years. All five-star ratings on Amazon. But if I write one on love, it might get three or four stars. And it, it, it would be a good book. But it's not a popular thing because we don't understand what love is. Love actually locks you into your destiny. It, it literally overrules everything. Which means that you have to have love to drive out fear. So you can't get rid of fear unless you're perfected in love, which is why you're afraid of the dark or you're afraid of the unknown. Or oh, here's a big one, fear of failure. Fear of failure. And, and Sven, he, he's here, he's, he's one of our pilots. He's also my instructor. He made me a captain in a year from, from trying to find my way around an airplane. But the thing of it is, is he's taught me the learning process. And I, I have learned that failure is not what we think. Failure is part of the learning process. And the choking points, the reason you have choking points where you feel like you can't go on is because you have, you yourself have limited your ability to go on. You have. Because the learning process has to give way for you to, to fail. Okay, so you fail a test. So you retake it. But you already take it. You already know what the right answers are. Find out which ones you missed. The five or six you missed, study them all night. Study unity, love, glory. Those three. Faith, hope, and love. 
you see those three remain, study those, and you're going to pass your test. Demons cannot operate in love. But see, love is not giving permission for stupid people. You can't let people be stupid and hurt you. You can get out of the way. You don't have to let people be stupid. Now, come on, listen. Well, you're all looking at me. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus called it as it was. When people didn't get healed, he said, why did you doubt? Why did you, why did you, why did you fear? And when they asked, why didn't, why didn't the demon go? Because you, you had... You had little faith. Oh, that goes over well. They could vote you out of a pastorship so fast, the same afternoon that you preached it. That's why we're in a hotel. <laughs> I, I haven't gotten fired. Okay, but Jesus addressed things talking about fear, about doubt, and lack of faith. But faith works through love. Okay, so the big one is fear of failure. And when you talk to people, you realize that they're afraid to try it, which you shouldn't do. You shouldn't try anything. Right. Yeah. You should do it with the intention of succeeding, but you should also do it with the fact that you're going to learn. So, are you fully convinced that you're going to succeed at whatever God has written about you, which is what you should be concentrating on. You should only be studying the right answers for the test. You don't worry about if the world is round, the earth is round, or if we really did go to the moon. And I think it's amazing because you can buy a telescope I mean, it wouldn't be any use here because there's like one night that you could probably see the stars. But, <laughs> but you know, because I lived here. So, you know, every now and then a miracle happens, right? So, and then sometimes it only rains once a day instead of twice a day here. So, you know, I, I get all that. But you can buy a telescope and you can look through it. And I, I've seen the rings of Saturn and Jupiter and Mars and the moon. And, you know, they're all round. But poor Earth, you know, it's, it's a pizza. <laughs> I'm just so glad I'm on the pepperoni side of it, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing is, is that everything's round for a reason. Yeah. And if you understand science and everything about that, you can, you can get what I'm saying. But this is what I'm saying is I'm using this because there's many people screaming at me online right now. And I, I totally enjoy it because I can't hear them. <laughs> but here's my point is, here's my point. When it comes down to it, if you can love your neighbor as yourself, and you can love God with all your heart, with all your mind and all your strength, it's, it eliminates the whole law because it fulfills the whole law. So if you love God, Paul said, you will give not out of compulsion, but because you love God and you are full of joy. And out of that joy, it literally says, out of that joy you give. But not out of compulsion. Because God, what? He loves a joyful giver. Why? Because we are not under the law. Why? Because love is greater. And so these, he said, if you can do this, if you can love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart, you fulfill all the law. So it's actually three things because it says that you have to love yourself as your neighbor. So that's, that's two there. You got to love yourself and you got to love your neighbor as yourself and you got to love God. Not in that order, but, you know, you don't need to spend two hours in the mirror to love yourself. You could just settle it that you love yourself. So it's not focusing to the place where it's excessive, but if you love, if you love people, I know, I know this, it's because you love yourself. Why do you love yourself? Because you're loved by God. Okay, so why do you love God? Because he first loved you. So this is the order. And this is why most people, when they become a Christian, it's because they don't want to go to hell. 
that is not a disciple. That is a convert. And you did that out of fear. You didn't do that because you had a revelation of a loving father. And this has been the problem. A lot of us, including myself, didn't want to go to hell. Okay, so what that does is that is get you a position in Christ. You're the holiness of, you're, the, you're holy as he's holy. You're righteous. You're the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. You're, you have all these positional things, but you have no relationship. You don't know your father. And you've not experienced a, a father on this earth because Satan makes sure of that. You know, and, you know, for me, my whole childhood, my, my parents didn't even know whose I was because my mom was dating different people. Well, that went over well when my dad married my mom because then he didn't think I was his. So no relationship. But I didn't know why. I, I grew up not understanding why I wasn't loved because I hadn't done anything wrong. So how many of you, you're considered an accident but Jesus, clearly when I was in heaven, he breathed into mother's wombs and people were born. And it didn't matter your genealogy because you have one parent in heaven. His name is Yahweh. And he breathed you into your mother's womb and you went into somebody's womb and your mother was privileged to carry you for nine months. Privileged. It was a privilege. You weren't an accident because you, your spirit came from God. This world is messed up. Okay, so your destiny is written in a book before you were born. Each one of your days was written in that book before one of them came to pass. So Psalms 139 is considered to be the most profound thing I saw in heaven. The whole chapter is profound because Jesus said, I've gone to your future and I'm standing there. And I've also come behind you to protect you from the hurts of your past. I've paved the way to your future. It's in, it's in the Aramaic version of it. So all of you have no choking point. Okay, so this is a final thing I want to talk about, and then I'll get into my message. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, 30, we're still early. We, we burn a lot of fuel to get here. Okay, so here's the other thing that, that I want to finalize in this, this precious teaching. It's, one of, it's going to be one of my favorite books. Is that we are part of a family that part is in heaven and a part of it is on the earth. So it's, Paul said, together with each other, we fulfill God's plan and purpose for the ages. So all of us, family in heaven, family on the earth, we all together fulfill everything that was in God's heart. Okay, so everyone that's up there, they all did everything that they could do to hand the baton off to us in a favorable position, in a favorable manner, so that we could run, and listen to me, add to what they did, not maintain. <laughs> so, <laughs> there, there's, you need to stop trying to win. Because, this, what you're going through is just preparation. Mm -hmm. When you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing, you can't stop laughing <laughs> from the joy. And I know, listen, I know, I know when, we've all, when we all start arriving at this, it's because you can look out over the crowd and you look and you see your faces and you know that you've obtained the, pro I know when you've obtained the promises. 
I know what, when Peter said that through these precious promises we've, that, that were given to us, it says we are partakers of the divine nature. And we have overcome. It says, it says that we've overcome the corruption that's in the world through us. The only way that I can see when somebody, I've met somebody that's been through everything and they're still alive and they don't even know why they're still alive, but you can see it in their eyes. They have overcome the corruption that's in the world caused by lust. They are completely free. They are full of joy. And each day is a gift. And it doesn't matter what's happening. And they're not worried because they know God's got this in their life. You have to get to this place. And when you do that, you're a partaker of the divine nature, it says. So you literally are partner, partnering with God. And that'll get you kicked out of church. Who do you think you are? On well, the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. And that will really upset them. But then you tell them you're a friend of God too as well. And that you talk regularly to him. See, the whole plan was that Jesus Christ would hand this off to us and that we would be Jesus Christ on the earth all together. So you don't need another apostle or a prophet. You need to hear from God, let it ignite you, and you be the next move of God. All of you. God wants to start a move of God in this area, and he wants to do it through you. He wants to do it through all of us together. This is the plan of the ages. I do not want Jesus to appear to another person on the Isle of Patmos to write a letter to me to tell me to get into gear. That's already been done. Come on now. I'm, I, got, I got the letter to the, from the Laodiceans. I got the letter from the Colossians. I know, I know. It's time to drink, I know. I can feel it in this room. This is a hands-free ministry, I know. But we're not going, you're not going to have to get that ladder because you have one. And you're going to drink of the Spirit. And you're going to finish this race in this life with joy. And you're going to finish it without limitations. Paul did. Paul finished it. And he spent most of his life in jail. But he said, I consider myself a happy man. He wasn't bound by anything. He actually said this chains were, were for, that, for the people he's writing to. He said, I did this for you. And you know, all these super apostles and these super prophets, I just want to see their backs because I want to see if they have 39 stripes on their back. Because that's what Paul said was the marks of an apostle. Was he bare on his body the marks of Jesus. That was his ID. He didn't have a super apostle, prophet, evangelistic, pastoral, bishop. He just took off, a, you know, when they asked, I need to see your ID, he took his shirt off. <laughs> I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Why? Because he, Paul knew that it was worth it. And everything he did, and he said in his letters, was for the people. Okay, so ministry has to become about people. Oh, has it come to that? Has it come to that? Oh, it's about people? I thought it was about money and popularity and fire tunnels and smoke machines and lights. You know, has it become something that we didn't intend for it to become, you know, it, it just takes a little correction just to make it more about the fact that everything we do, we have to honor God with. So everything, whether it be in word or deed, we must do it for the Lord. Every, every, every day you go to work, you have to do it for the Lord. You work for the Lord. I bought, I bought, we bought the warrior jet, the, the jet from Sven. 
and he never left the jet. I have asked him to leave. He just keeps <laughs> it. <laughs> no, he's, he became my instructor. But, you know, it's so interesting. That, that plane was immaculate. I couldn't believe it. It was the first one that Embraer made to be bought by public. The first three were just test beds. We're number four. And you wouldn't know that it was, you know, 11 years old or whatever. Well, you would know it was the first one. And it's so interesting is, is that his airplane, he's got one just like it. And it's just so beautiful. And he's up there cleaning every dial, every, every screen, and there's no dust. And, and it's just so interesting how God did such a miracle. And during the flight, the first officer's watching me clean all my screens. And I'm keeping everything clean, you know. And if something breaks, I just get it replaced. It's like I don't try to fix it with duct tape, like some people. Okay, what is it? It's ownership. It has to do with discerning what God has done and taking care of it. And this is what we don't do with ourselves. We don't take care of ourselves. We don't view that we have treasure inside of us, that, we, that we're irreplaceable. If any one of you would pass away, God is going to have to do a miracle to get things done that you were supposed to do. And this is why we're suffering. We're suffering because if one suffers, we all suffer. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's in the Bible. <laughs> but here's the thing is, is if you just start to honor yourself and what God has put in you and honor and receive from God his love, you're not going to have to worry about your faith. I'm serious. <laughs> the one who is in me does not doubt. Does not doubt me. The angels that are sent that are standing all around me right now, they don't doubt me. They've never doubted. The Holy Spirit inside me, he's never doubted that I'm gonna, he's never thought I was gonna fail. Jesus, when he breathed me in his mother's womb, he never thought I was gonna fail. Never. There's no one in heaven that thinks I'm going to fail. No one. I was there. I know. They all believe in me. Okay, but they believe in everybody down here because we're all one family. But see, they're in the know now. And they want you to know this. They want you to know that you can do this life, but you're not maintaining. You're here to make history. And how you do that is you locate yourself by saying something. And then you do something. All right, so in this room right now, is, it's become a room of revelation because the Spirit of God is the person who reveals Jesus. He, he comes to reveal Jesus. He, he tells us the truth, Jesus said. When he comes, he's going to reveal truth to us, which is the word for reality. So when the spirit of reality comes, he will lead you into all reality. That's what it literally says. So I want to know reality. I want to know the truth because I don't have a choking point. See, you're afraid that you might learn something or know something that you can't handle. But see, it's eating you and tormenting you because you don't know. You need to know. Why? Because the discrepancy is, is that in your spirit, Paul said, you know all things. So when you get to heaven, you don't ask if the earth was round. And, and the, one, the one thing I wanted to ask Jesus, why is there 10 hot dogs in a package and only eight buns? <laughs> but it, did, it never came up. I couldn't understand why it takes 17 people standing around. One person has a shovel 
and the other 16 are supervisors. <laughs> and when they're done filling the pothole, it's actually a bump now instead of a hole. But I didn't ask him any of that stuff. I didn't ask him about dinosaurs or UFOs. I let him talk because he created me by love, and he wrote about me in a book by love, and now he's enforcing it inside of me through the Holy Spirit by love, and he's asking me to receive from him love, and it drives out fear. Now, when fear is gone, you're made perfect in love. There is no limitations anymore because you really don't care if people roll eyes at you or they do something or don't do something. I don't sit around and think about the whys. I'm always thinking about how. And I'm telling you, this, this is a word for everybody in here by the Spirit of God. Now, if you want, I can call you out individually. It'll take all night, and I'll tell you the same word, but it's because Kevin gave you a personal word that you'll actually believe it. Or you could just believe it. But I'm telling you, you need to receive this word from God. And what it is, is this, is that you have already been accepted. You have already been chosen. He chose you. You didn't choose him. To quote a famous person, you know, Jesus said, I've chosen you. You didn't choose me. Okay, so he chose you, and he wrote a book about you, and he is saying right now to you that you can do that book. Okay, which means that he will finance you. Because you're sent. Now listen to me. I don't need your money. I need you. I want you to fulfill what God has put inside of you that's written about you. And I want you to speak from this place of love and break the living daylights out of the demonic in your life. I mean, I'm talking break it apart Beat the living daylights out of the devil that's harassing you. Jesus said it. You'll trample on serpents and scorpions. You not dress up like them in Halloween. He didn't say dress up like your serpents and scorpions. He said trample on them. He said you shall have power over all the enemy. So you have to deal with things spiritually. And you watch what happens to the people that are puppets. You watch what happens. Things will be overturned. Because you go after the source. See, it should be a sign to you that God is calling things that are not as though they were because they are. But it's through the church. Now, all those spirits of the children that have not even been born yet are waiting to be put in wombs. But at the end of the age, you can imagine that in the last days, Jesus talked about the spirit of Elijah. He talked about, uh, you know, those, that generation that would proclaim his coming. And that spirit of John the Baptist, the spirit of Elijah was on him. And, you know, all these things. But did you ever think about this, that... You know, there are writings about Noah that Satan tried to take him out as a child. And then we have Moses, who was a deliverer as well, and they try to take him out. And then when Jesus came, Herod tried to take all the babies out. So you had the babies being attacked every time that Satan caught wind that there was a deliverer in the womb. So you had Noah... And I haven't seen these writings, but I've been told that they exist. I'm just waiting for them to come to me. But then Moses, of course, we see that was Pharaoh. Then we see Herod with Jesus. And then now they legalized the killing of babies. Yeah. Okay, so that a whole generation would be wiped out if they had their way. This is because there is a deliverer in the womb. 
Okay, there is, there is the voice of one calling in the desert that the second coming of the Lord, so this prophetic generation that was in the womb, there was such a threat. Satan was looking at the stars and trying to figure out what's going on. And this is what the magicians did. They saw the positions of the stars and they came to Jesus. But nobody told the Pharisees. They didn't even show up. But you had magicians show up. You had shepherds show up. But where were the Pharisees, the head of the denomination of the day? Where were they? They were the ones assigned to watch for the Messiah, for the people of Israel, and announce his coming. Instead, they killed him. They did not show up. But the shepherds did, the angels did, and the magicians did. You call them magi. So what? Just a couple letters missing. <laughs> they were magicians. They came because of the star. Hello. Okay, so you got this generation is a threat. The womb is a threat. I just read, I just read it. They said, the problem is, is because of people that believe in pro-life, that's why there's a shortage of baby formula. They actually said that. That's not the reason there's a shortage of baby formula. Because people want to have babies. The reason you have baby formula is because people have babies. It's supply and demand. That's all I'm going to say. That way we stay on the air, okay? Now listen to me. If this is such a threat that they had to legalize it. And then, when I heard three years ago, Lord, and I announced it, that Ver, Roe versus Wade will be overturned, I said, what did I just say? It was too late. It was on Daystar. Okay, and I thought, that, that is a miracle. That is a total miracle. But he did it. Okay, but that is just the beginning. That's the beginning. Okay, thank you, Jesus. All right, now I'm saying this because now you have to take the, the leverage and the momentum of seeing God answer the fact um, that the church was the church and took their authority. You have to see now that you got the spatula in between the pan and the piece of pizza. And it's not the earth. But you got the spatula in there. You got the leverage in there now. So now you just keep driving. I've seen this. I've seen devils in people. They got so nervous because they realized that I could see the second set of eyes in the human being, I could see, they knew that I saw them inside of a person. And the demon spirit got very nervous because they've been found out. And what I, I realized is, is the body of Christ has to, has to start consciously thinking this way. Satan's power is in his ability to cloak. Yeah. He, he hides. He's a coward. He does not, his mode of operation is to stay hidden and stay behind the scenes so that you have to use your mind to figure out if this is a devil or if this is a person or if this was me did this or if this was God or if this was a devil. So you're constantly saying, did I do this? Did this happen because I, I was stupid or was this? See, you're not supposed to do this. You can't handle this. You're supposed to go down in here and call the shots according to what the spirits say. So you are well able to take the land. We are well able. But there were only two people. So guess what? They had to suffer for a whole generation. And then Joshua ended up being the leader. We don't have to go through this. We can be that. So I want to ask you this. I know you think it's easier to be a follower than a leader. But... I'm just telling you, in heaven, there are no followers. Mm. There are disciples that became leaders, but there's no followers. Mm. Because Jesus' whole goal was to replicate himself. He said, I want you to do the same works that I am doing, and even greater than these shall you do, because I go to the Father. Well, last time I checked, he did get there. 
because he sent the Spirit, okay? That means that now we are leaders. Mm -hmm. And I don't wait for people to lead anymore. I allow myself to be mentored and taught to the place where my failure rate is very small because I'm trained. I keep training, walking in the Spirit, getting accurate to the place where I lead. And all of you are called to lead. None of you are called to follow. And I know that doesn't go over well, but in heaven, God did not... See, no matter what I say, people are going to take it wrong. But there are, there are disciples that become leaders. There are no people that are actually professional followers. <laughs> because all of you have a piece that we all need. Every one of you has something that someone else needs. Okay, so what do you do now? Well, this is what we do now. We, uh, we, we, we think about these things and we allow the fire to be ignited. Okay, so the glory of God is so strong that it actually heals you. And I'm gonna tell you things that I saw in heaven that because I was associated with different movements, I just wanted to keep peace with everybody. But I, I'm, I'm past that now. In the glory, in the glory of God, you don't even have to have faith. When the gift of faith comes on me, I cannot doubt, even I've tried to doubt, and I cannot doubt when the gift of faith comes in. I cannot when an angel comes and stands beside me, I cannot doubt. Not because of my faith, but because that angel's here. That goes over well. <laughs> now think about this. Something from the other realm comes and helps you because you need help. If you don't think you need help, then I can't help you either. Nobody can. <laughs> if you you got to have to, you got to qualify for the help. So you receive the help, but when Jesus comes, by his spirit, or if he comes in person, or the angels come, whenever someone comes alongside to help you, you can do something that you couldn't do before. That's the whole plan. The whole idea here is not to get so pumped up that you, in the flesh and in your mind, think you're, you're indestructible. You're a victorious warrior because in the Bible, Jesus is called a victorious warrior. God himself is a warrior. That's how we named our ministry, Zephaniah 317. The Lord is a warrior. So in heaven, I saw that because he is a victorious warrior, you win. If you are associated with him through covenant, which doesn't mean that you have to be better than him, or better than anyone else, you just have to be associated with him. It ends up that the, the, the rejects of the world are the ones that end up being with him because they're the ones that are humble and contrite. And Isaiah said that God is the high and lofty one, but he also dwells with those who are humble and contrite in spirit. And so in heaven I saw that the people that do anything for God are the ones that know they're not all that. And they need help and they cry out to God and they, they don't think that they would ever be the one that would do it. Jesus told me that I was perfect for the job because I didn't want to do it. I told him I don't want to do this. I don't want to come back. I don't want to do this. I, I'm fine with just retiring. I'm fine with everything. And, 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 and he said, you're perfect because I didn't want to do it. And I don't, need, I don't need any of this. Kathy and I don't need any of this. We don't need any of this. But the Lord said that this generation could be the one that it does not default to the next one, that we actually pick it up and we do it. Do it. We can change history. Do we do it by letting us be, be the person. We receive from God his love. We don't receive faith. We don't receive gifts of spirit. See, you think you need money. You think you need all these things. You just need love. And then love will drive out fear, which means the devil's going to leave, which means your blockade is going to leave, which means there's plenty coming to you. 
And you don't have to give to me to get it. And you can get my anointing without giving in the offering. And did you know that even if you didn't give tonight, I'm still coming back? Even if you don't give. Because I'm sent. Okay, so this is the way. You should go to your job, not because you like it or you hate it. You go because that's where God has assigned you. And you're working your way out of it. And I used to tell my bosses, I'm just, I'm just passing through. And one time I stayed for almost 30 years. And I turned down all kinds of promotions. And in fact, they said, listen, we have a program. We will send you to, um, I almost mentioned, I won't mention that, but I, they were going to send me to an airline and fly regional jets. And then you can keep your employee number, you can keep your package, and then you can come back as a first officer. And I go, yeah, but I make twice what a first officer makes. And so on the airplane, I had to decide what I was really supposed to be doing. Because if you do the calculations of going, and I was ready to go right before 9-11, I would have never got back to Southwest. Everything was locked up for years. So if I would have taken that, I would have never got back. Is everybody here that way? Yes. So what does it matter? I would have had two years at a regional jet, and I couldn't even get back as a flight attendant. Or I could just stay as a flight attendant because that's what God told me to do. And now I get, I, everything came to me. Nice. And now I pass Southwest jets all the time because they're so slow. <laughs> I'm serious. They say, can you slow down? You got Southwest in front of you. I go, okay, I'll slow down for Southwest. <laughs> Y'all ought to get some faster jets. You know? But see, the thing of it is, is that what you have coming to you has already been ordained to, to come to you. Yeah. And authority is not faith. Because you can be the smallest. The, you could be the weakest. But if you have authority except for here, you know, with the police and everything here, but you know what I'm saying, you know, the police, but you know, you know what I'm saying though, is that it's what's behind you. It's not your physical size. A person in authority doesn't have to use physical strength if the people respect authority, but that's a whole nother thing. But what I'm telling you is when Jesus spoke, he didn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, he's not, he's not physically big. He's even shorter than me. And I think he's on keto because he, he weighed like uh, under 200 pounds. <laughs> and he was very fit. And his, he was like bronze. I mean, he was bronze. He wasn't, he wasn't white. He didn't have blue eyes. Sorry. But he wasn't physically, you know, physically overpowering. But when he spoke, he spoke with authority and he spoke with love and he spoke with the same breath to me that he spoke when he breathed me into my mother's womb, which is my point tonight, is really, did Jesus give you any choking points? Or is it something that is causing you to process things wrong to where you can't go on? Okay, why can't you go on? I guarantee you it's because of fear. I guarantee you that it's fear of failure. I think that we need to get out of the victim mentality here. And, you know, I'm going to come back and I'm going to strengthen the body of Christ here. But what I need is I need disciples. I don't need converts. I don't need followers. I really don't like this. You might like this, but I don't like this. What I like is, is sitting around saying, okay, we're going to pray in tongues until devils start screaming. You know, that's what I, and I say, here's how we're going to do it. So that's what we do at our spirit schools. We have Kathy, we turn Kathy loose in prayer school, and we pray out things. And we, we, we in our school, it's, it's all application. You know, it's all teaching the students how to do this. And then become, we have over 1,600 fellowships all over the world. We just started, uh, I think it's just barely two years, right? 1,600. You know, we just started just barely four years ago and 30,000 students. And it's because I care about people, but
but it's based on love. It's not based on performance. It's based on handing it off and working myself out of a job, just like Jesus did. Jesus' whole goal was to hand it off. He was not afraid for you to do better. Do you ever notice that? No one wants to talk about that. That he said, you're going to do greater works. Now it's, well, that's more, that's, just, that's, that's quantity. Really? So you're raising the dead. Well, let's just start with that. What, what's harder, raising the dead or casting out a devil? What's easier, healing the sick? That none of them are, are capable of being done by a person. It has to be the Spirit. So it shouldn't be any harder to raise the dead than it is to cast out a devil or heal the sick or preach the good news. Okay, so deliverance has come to you because Jesus' name in Hebrew is salvation, which is deliver, the word deliverance. So at the end of Psalms 91, which Jesus is quoting in Luke when he said, you're going to trample on serpents, scorpions, have power over the enemy, it is word for word what is written in Psalms 91. He's quoting Psalms 91. But at the end of Psalms 91, it says, you shall know my salvation. And in Hebrew, when you read it in Hebrew, it says, you shall know my Yeshua. It actually says Jesus' name right there. I want to tell you that you have been robbed because the real Jesus has not been allowed to come to you in a relationship. It's all been formality, and if you give, you're going to get. If you pray in tongues enough, you're going to build your faith up. All these things become work-based instead of, instead of love-based because love is the greatest of all these. If you don't love your neighbor, if you don't have love, all the gifts it says are just like tingling symbols and just a bunch of noise. And you can give everything up, all your belongings. You can give it to the poor and have your body burned. If you don't have love, it's, it's worth nothing. When's that quoted in church? So you can keep giving and giving and giving. But if you don't have love, so, so I believe that most people don't receive their return on their giving because they did not give it out of love. They gave it out of compulsion. You gave it because you wanted to get, because you need it. So you gave it to sow into someone else, someone else's anointing or whatever, whatever weird thing you were told, <laughs> instead of because you love God. See, if you give because you love God, that touches his heart. And I guarantee you, not even Amazon will keep up. <laughs> that truck is going to be there every day. I'm telling you, your father will make sure you have everything. Everything you need. Yes. Uh, I know that he is not the one that is denying you what you need. I know that. It is Satan. Mm -hmm. Someone needs to tell you this. Yeah. Now, can you handle the truth? Because I'm telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. It's about to get hot in here. All right, get ready, get ready. This, this uh, realm down here, what I saw is it's parallel. There's another realm that's parallel. And it looks like this realm. And when I died, I didn't know I died because I could still see everything. And I could not contact the people that were in the room. No matter what I did, I could not communicate with them. I could feel them. I could hear them. I could walk on the floor. I could walk around, but I could not communicate with them. They did not know that I was out of my body. To them, I was laying on the operating table. And I saw how angels come and stand beside you, and you feel and you sense something shift. And I see that when the Holy Spirit comes on people, it comes upon them, at times it bursts from within you, and you light up. You literally light up. And the demons see that, and they know that God is doing something, but they don't know what it is. And so they, they start to hit you with things 
to, to break the momentum of what God is doing. They don't know what's happening. They just see you light up like a Christmas tree. But if you don't believe in Christmas trees, that's fine. I'll take yours because I like Christmas trees. And you know what? It's, it's demon free. The whole time the Christmas tree's up, no problems. Can you imagine that? And you know, when I wear a hat, when I preach, it doesn't even dim diminish the anointing. And when I have jewelry on, no problem. I could wear a hat. My head could be covered. Can you believe it? You, you, know, you know, I have to fly on the Sabbath because I have to take my, my, my staff home. You know, the anointing still is strong. Why are you doing what you're doing? Is it because of fear? Because these evil spirits, they're pushing you to stay in works and they want you to lose your momentum when God starts to move. So this is what you do. So this is happening. I'm getting, I'm getting uh, several a day now since Orlando and since then Berlin. I, I announced that the angels will start coming into your house at night and they will start to stand beside you while you're sleeping and you're gonna wake up and hear singing. Mm -hmm. It's happening. It's happening so much that I felt I should announce it because it's happening a lot. Angels are starting and people are hearing, they're hearing people singing, but there's no one there. And this used to happen in every service with me. Every service, I could hear the angel, like right now they're singing. And so that's when I tell them to come up because we have heaven's help here and then we just do the song of the Lord. Right now, there are angels, I can hear them singing, but it's very high. And they're singing right now. And what will happen is you'll start to feel in your spirit a shift. When this happens, this is when you need to say some things. You need to take your physical and your mental realm, and you need to hook up with your spirit into the spirit realm. And you need to give your body a timeout. You need to give your mind a timeout. And you need to do what Paul said. Paul said, when you speak in an unknown tongue, your, your mind does not participate in it. It's not fruitful, it says in the King James, but you know, that's kind of foreign. It, it's not participating in it because you're speaking to God. Now he's talking about praying in tongues in an unknown tongue. In the church, with, when you are speaking in tongues as a gift of the Spirit, he said, don't do that unless there's an interpreter. But he said he prayed in tongues more than all of them. Okay, so when you pray in tongues, you're not speaking to men, but to God. So how could that be the gift of the Spirit? Because in the church, you're to speak for a public. So don't speak in a tongue unless someone can interpret what you're saying to edify. He said, I would pray for the better gifts, which is prophecy in the church, in a congregation. But he said, when you pray in an unknown tongue, pray, you are speaking to God, not to man. Okay, so your spirit is communicating with God, and your mind is not participating in it. And this is where most Christians don't go any further, because they don't have the ability to participate mentally or physically in something, and it makes them feel out of sorts. This is the choking point that needs to go. You need to be able to transfer over and get a glimpse at where you're going. See, where I'm going is I want an airline and you're worried about us having an airplane. I wanna take single moms, single parents and their kids, pick them up and bring them to our conferences and pay for everything. So I'm not like, I don't, my choking point is not where everybody else would be because I'm, I'm going somewhere. But what I'm doing is I'm allowing God to take me further to help people than most people would feel comfortable with because they have this choking point. But these familiar spirits, these evil spirits that are harassing you, they do not want me to say these things to you because when I was out of my body, it was a parallel world and the devils could do nothing when I saw them. When I saw them, they were completely powerless because they were known. And when I saw the angels and how they work, I saw so many different angels and I, that most of them didn't have wings. 
And that goes over well because you want your wings, you know. And everybody's like, you know, they say, oh, I was in heaven and I saw these angels and they had wings and this angel came to me and they had big wings and rough. I'm like, angels, the messenger angels, all those angels, they, they look like men. They don't, they don't have wings. They don't need wings. They fly without wings. Airplanes need wings. Angels don't need wings to fly. Wings are on the seraphim and on the cherubim and they're to protect. They're to guard. They have a purpose. But angels don't need wings to fly because they're in another realm. Okay, so evil spirits, they have no purpose because they have been disembodied from the flood. They were the hybrid race that was destroyed by the flood. Only eight made it through. So all these millions of evil spirits are trapped in this realm. And they are waiting judgment day. They thought that Jesus had come to torment them and to cast them into the pit. And they thought that he would send them out of the area, which they didn't want because they were building up this big matrix in, in different cities. And they, they have all this stuff going on right now in Seattle. And you start messing with that and they're gonna start to come at you. If you're being visited, they're gonna come at you. They don't know why you're being visited, but they consider you a threat. But this is the thing, they're under your feet and you have to immediately respond and not think it's your imagination and put it into it. And you establish your authority in this city. And I was, when I was here, Kathy and I did more praying than we did anything else. And I, and I, don't, I, don't, I think we were here seven years in Bothell. And um, it's like, it's amazing, you know, I, I flew on the turn to final. You look, out the, you look out and we flew right over my house where we lived in Bothell. Right over, the, right over the golf course. And I'm thinking, did I ever see that one day we would be flying over this place in a warrior jet? <laughs> no, think about it. What, what you encountered last year, look, you're still alive. Did you even think you'd make it through the Greek alphabet? <laughs> I mean, you were... The animal of the week? Like, what, what is the threat? You were waiting for the next thing to happen. I want you to get past this and, and know that you're loved and that you can't lose. I mean, the best thing that happened is you could go to heaven right now. I mean, you wouldn't want to come back. But I saw this other realm and I saw that all these things are available for you. And that angels are waiting to implement the holy spirit is waiting to implement the covenant has been established and we are not to be arguing with each other we're not to be criticizing each other we're supposed to be gathering together and praying and establishing our authority in different cities and so that's what we're doing that's what we're doing at warrior notes but i i don't want church people i want people that don't have a church i i want unsaved people so I'm not looking to compete with churches. I just want the people that don't want to go to church. I want to give them a hot meal every week through a Bible study. And if they need blankets and water or whatever they need or rent money, that they can have a fellowship they can come to. And that fellowship will provide that. I believe that God is going to prosper all these things. So I, I'm, I want every student, all 30, there's almost, there's going on 31,000. I want them all to have a fellowship. And I want them to not have any church people in there from other churches. I want them to have people that don't are done with church. I want, I, want, I want you to bring your boss who's not saved. I want you to bring unsaved people and get them saved. I'm not trying to fix churches. I want to start new ones. The Lord told me don't fix the churches. That's what he told me. And he told me also this. He said, you can't convert a goat to a lamb. You, you can't make a goat a lamb. So don't even try. You can't make a tear a wheat. You can't make an unwise virgin a wise one. That is, that is God that divided that. That is the angels that do that at the end of the age. It's not up to us to do that. But the, the, this, I was warned before all this happened, I was warned that this was going to cause the division. There was going to be a separation, and the separation is clear now. 
And so all of you, I'm calling you to rise up in the spirit and be part of the biggest and the greatest move of God that has ever hit this earth, ever hit this earth, because it's you. It's you operating in the spirit. You can do this. We can do this together. Okay, so we're all tied together. Okay, good. All right, so we're all tied together. We're all gonna do this together. You're never gonna give another dime to anything and unless God's love in you compels you to do it. You're gonna do it out of love. And then you're gonna demand that your harvest comes in because you sowed, you sowed in the wrong way. You gave for the wrong reason. And we all need to repent. And we're gonna see that, that harvest come in I'm telling you, this is, you, you read chapter 8 and chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, which is never preached. If you read that, you're going to be set free. Because Paul said, Paul said, listen, those who are prospering right now, you need to give to help those who are having a hard time. So that, we'd have, that we would have some sort of commonality, equivalency. So we, Ananias and Sapphira were judged because they didn't have to do anything. That money didn't leave the church building. The offering was supposed to be distributed to the poor. Those who were, they did this type of offering. So people that, that could sell stuff and then lay the money there at Peter's feet. He was not the first pope, I checked. They laid the money there and then they distributed it to the poor. And Paul, Paul even said, take the offering before I get there. This is not for my benefit, it's for your benefit. And God, he said, is able to, to lay it on you for your generosity. He is going to give you everything so that you have more to give to others in need. So this is the way it is with authority, with everything in your life. You can do this. I'm not going to walk off this, this, out of this room until I know that this is established in you. I will stand here and stare at you for another 10 minutes if I have to. I'm not, I'm not released to leave, and I want to go. Right now, I want to go, but I'm not going to do it until you, you, you got to agree with me that we have such a huge opportunity here. Stop saying you can't do something because you automatically just got signed up to do it. Come on now. There's no a benefit for me to do any of this that I'm doing. This is because God loves you and I love you. And I don't want anything you have. I just need you. What I need to do is wrap this thing up down here. Kathy and I, we just say, let's wrap it up. We, we do this, wrap it up. We, when we're praying, we pray in tongues and we'll pass each other in our house. We're praying in the spirit and we go, wrap it up. And I, like we're just wrapping up and then we go, follow me, you know. And we just like, Phew. we pray in tongues until we get a release. And then we just go about our day. And I'm, 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 an, I'm anointed by the fire of the altar so that you can be anointed with the fire of the altar. You know, and you can, you, you've got this impartation just by sitting here. You don't need to give in the offering. You don't need to buy my books. You don't need me to ha lay hands on you. The, the, it is all, you've already received it. It was free. And I'm telling you, you will never be the same. What is in this room is on you. And it's in you right now. I'm telling you. So we're going we're gonna to worship a little bit. And um, I want you to pray that God works it out so that we can come back and, and do a full-blown spirit school. Uh, we tried to do this right before COVID broke out. We actually had this, this hotel. And it was just, yes, I want to, trust me. I, I, um, I, we were this close, right, Ryan, to being here within just, I mean, they almost let us come. And then, so we had to, for a couple of years, we just went to places where they would allow us. And um, we didn't ever stop praying for the sick or stop preaching the gospel. And you know, there are times, I mean, I remember 13 weeks in a row, I did spirit schools from my studio by myself. <laughs> I did three day seminars from my studio during COVID. 
but now we can do this. And I'm just believing that this is all, I, I stayed here as a crew member with Southwest Airlines for 15 years. I was here almost every week. Ate at the restaurant today that I used to eat at. Had no idea that I'd ever be here, you know, doing a conference. So I'm telling you, there are so many things that you're going to look back and say, wow, God was really, really talking through Kevin. I'm telling you, I was sent here to tell you, you need to insert yourself in to what God's flow is right now and watch everything change. Watch it. Okay. Um, do we have a, a handheld mic, Kathy? I want you to speak, pray from the Spirit. And then I want, um, I would like... Um, I would also like uh, Masood and Sarah to pray, and then uh, Norm and and um, uh, I, uh, you know Norm, Norm, Norm here. Norm, Norm sat with me in class at Ray, Rayma, <laughs> and we got it. <laughs> and now he's like sitting here in the front row. With, I'm thinking about like we're sitting there, and. A guy named Max was on the other side of me. And, and we're all just sitting there. We just sit there and listen. Wouldn't move. And then Max went to Romania and started a Rama Bible training center over there. And then I went and helped at a church up here. And Norm was one of the ushers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we sat together in the same classes. And I'm, I'm telling you this because last week, while when we were in Berlin, the Lord said, you share because I was told by the Lord, you share what Brother Hagen said, and you, you make this your ministry now, what he, he said, because he wants, I just met with his daughter, Pat Harrison. We had lunch together, and I got a call and said, do you want to you want to have lunch with Pat Harrison? I go, <laughs> yeah. I, we just dropped everything. And I had lunch with her. And um, after that, she started telling me things about her dad that, you know, I hadn't heard before. And, you know, she, she was there with Brother Hagen, you know, daughter. He was, she was the daughter. And this is, the things that she said just started to ignite in me some things that I felt like needed to be picked up again. And so the Lord told me, told me reminded me of a prophecy while we were in class that Brother Hagen had. He said, he said, we've been known, everybody's listening, right? We have been known as a people of the word. He said, but he said, there is a whole move of God. I'm sitting there and I, I'm, I'm, I'm shaking right now. I can feel my, my hair. I think my hair's growing back. I can feel it. <laughs> I, I feel the power of God. And that's what he said. He said, but we're about to abort or lose a whole move of God because we need to be known as people of the spirit as well. And a whole move of God is going to be lost if we don't adjust. And I heard the Lord say, pick this up and make this your end time assignment. So in Berlin, I started, and I started sharing Zurich and Berlin and in Croatia, and I started sharing about how we need to allow the Spirit to have His way. Listen, you hang around me for a day and the limitations are going to come off because just like Sven, Sven's sitting, he was sitting in a hotel and this guy was telling like how he's never going to be a pilot because, you know, it's like this and he's like, you know, you know, you know he's like, oh, you ought to take some lessons, you know, and he goes, oh, no, no. And he's like, no, that, it's, it's not going to happen. He goes, yeah, you're right. It's never going to happen. <laughs> and the guy goes, what? He goes, well, you said it. <laughs> and the guy's like, and, and this is sometimes you need people in your life like, th like this. You need people to come into your life and say, yeah, just keep calling it in. You need, see, that's love. Jesus said to me, you will be held. I mean, he was this far from me with all that hair, that, that, the power of, of, the, of the king of the ages. And he said to me, you will be held accountable for every idle word that comes out of your mouth. 
He said, you're going to be acquitted by your words and you're going to be condemned by your words. You're literally going to be judged by what you say. It was in Matthew 12, 36. I didn't know it was there. And I'd been the Rama. <laughs> I came back from that. I was in bed for three weeks after that operation. I thought I was going to die again. But I had already done that, so I'd lived. But, <laughs> but I, 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 I didn't want to tell Jesus that that wasn't in the Bible because it, I didn't know it was in the Bible and I was a scholar. So I had to look it up and I was so embarrassed when I found it. I go, oh man, he was right. It's in red, you know. <laughs> so now you understand me a little better. You, you understand Warrior Notes a little better. Is that we literally want to end this thing on the earth. We want to end it and wrap it up. And this is how we do it. We become who we are by being the church and we take our authority. Whatever we permit will be permitted. Whatever we bind will be bound. So if we forbid it, it will be forbidden in heaven. If we permit it, it will be permitted. And this explains, because Brother Hagin said this, and I checked it out with Billy Brim, who is his editor, who helped him with all the books. I talked to her. She verified he said this. He said, if anything bad happens to America, it's the church's fault. That's what Jesus told him. This kind of flips it, doesn't it? Back. So you're, you're thinking that your serve was so hot that there's no way that anybody can return it. And then somebody returns it, and it's back in your court again. And this is what Jesus has done to the church. He's literally said, gotcha, back at you. It's you now. You can't say it's my fault. That's, that's what I know is going to happen to all of you. You're not going to have the excuse you think you're going to have. We are this generation. So I, I want Kathy to pray and um, then just go down the line there and anything they have. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Praise the Lord. You know, it says in the word that his voice is as the sound of many waters. And it says that out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. And I was just listening to Kevin just mention Billy Brim the Lord's called her to the people who are people of prayer. And so I listened to her quite a bit. And she brought out something that Brother Hagen had said that I hadn't heard before. And it just went off in me that the Lord said um, through him, he actually was, he had gotten it out of a book he was reading, but it just, it was like a rhema word to me that the river must flow. I declare the river must flow. The river in this region must flow. The river, say that with me, the river must flow. The river will flow. The river will flow out of me. Out of my belly will flow rivers of living water. Out of my belly will flow rivers of living water. Let's all stand up and let's let that river flow. Shama Tele Endo. In this region, the rivers of living water will flow. In this region, in this Washington state, belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Washington state belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, this is my state. This is my state. The blood of Jesus is shed on my state. Live again, live again. Let the river flow, let the river flow out of my belly. Put your hand on your belly and say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit and fire tongues of fire. Let me pray out everything you need me to pray out in this region, in this nation, and in my family, and in the world. Sarah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are the love of God for us, Father. Thank you that now we have Holy Spirit inside us. And Father, we ask for river of life to just flow in our school, in our ministry, in everywhere we go, Father. Let us be shine and be, let us be light for this Seattle and the state of Washington. Thank you, Jesus, for tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Fill us, fill us all with your Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Yes, Father, we love you, Jesus. Jesus, we love you. You are alive and you are here. Thank you, Father, for the revelation of your word that is the Spirit. Father, this is the time that we are awakening to our identity and and operate from our position that we are seated in Jesus Christ who are who we are father him as walking on the earth this is the time that father we, we get back what is belong to us this is the time that we ask father of your spirit to father to get glory to Jesus Christ we are claiming and we are asking father we ask for our family to come back we ask for freedom to come back we ask this country once again father to be the place that give you all glory and jesus is the lord jesus is the lord in seattle jesus is the lord in washington jesus is the lord in america jesus is the lord for the whole earth in the name above all name jesus 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 hallelujah I am asking every one of you to come alongside me because I want this state. I want this state, the state of Washington. I want it to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I want men and women of righteousness and integrity in positions of authority. I claim this state in the name of Jesus. Jesus, you are Lord of the state of Washington. You are a Lord from the Pacific, from Canada to Oregon to Idaho. You are Lord of this state. I claim it for the kingdom of God. I command you, come into the right and privilege of the living God. You foul spirits, I know you want to steal it from us. You have told me you want to steal it. You cannot have it. You cannot have it. You cannot have it. Jesus is Lord of the state of Washington. Jesus will rule in the state of Washington. I command the governor to be a godly man. I command the U.S. senators to be godly men, women. I command the congressman and women, their hearts will turn towards God. Their hearts will turn towards God. I see them, I know who they are. They will turn their hearts to the living God because Jesus is Lord. He's not going to be, he is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. Lord. Jesus is Lord of the state of Washington. You have no right. You have no... My feet are on this ground. I was born in the state of Washington. You cannot have my ground. You cannot take my ground. You've tried to rule, but you can't have it. I will not allow you to take it. No more. No more. Father, we just drink of your spirit right now. We just get so caught up with your plan and your purpose that we become what you need right now in this time. Father, pour out your spirit on everyone right now. I pray for everyone right now. Pour out on on your people right now 
liquid fire, holy fire, holy fire over everyone right now. All you students receive the impartation. Everyone in this room receive, receive the anointing right now. The power of the Holy Spirit, this, this place is on fire. Holy fire right now. Raise your hands and receive the altar fire, the cleansing fire. You've been, a, you've been set apart. You are set apart. You're holy. You are holy unto the Lord. Set apart as a holy nation. Fire. The angels, the angels are, are going through and walking amongst us. Receive right now. Fire. Holy fire.
Yes, there's rivers of living water rushing out of us. Oh, rivers of living water rushing out of us. Bring new life everywhere. Yes, there's rivers of living water rushing out of us. Oh, rivers of living water rushing out of us. There's rivers of living water rushing out of us. Bring new life, new life. I can feel the river. It's 
my joy to let go of everything I thought I knew And let your grace sweep me away Let your peace carry me away Let your freedom carry me away Cause I don't need to know anything else Than Christ alone Carry me away Carry me away Carry me away into 
Father, we thank you for everything that you did tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, I pray that everything that we received, you seal it up in our hearts, Father. May we never forget. May we take what we've learned and heard and run with it, Lord, like never before. And Lord, like what was prayed, Lord, turn this state the surrounding states upside down for your glory, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that the fallow ground has been plowed and now you're going to grow a mighty work in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we love you all. We'll see you next time. Run to me, run to my open arms.